I'm sorry to have you waited. Good evening, everyone. Again, I am Daisuke Yamamoto. I'm member of Lawyers for LGBT and Allies Network, LAM. Today, we want to welcome you to our event co-sponsored by Shibuya City and Lobout Waters Japan. As you've already known, this seminar is about the current status of LGBTQ rights in Japan. Let me hand over to Nagata-san for, for the opening remarks from Shibuya City. Nagata-san, please proceed. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this event today. My name is Ryutaro Nagata. I am a promotional lead for gender diversity and equality at Shibuya City Office. We are very proud to co-host this event with LAN. Today's event is streamed from Shibuya Diversity Center, IRIS. This center started 30 years ago as women's center, but at the timing that the city had introduced a same-sex partnership, it was changed to gender diversity center. We have approximately 30 people on site and some more people online. I hear that more than 100 people are registered uh, for online streaming. Shibuya is known as passionate for LGBTQ equality, but please let us explain why. Shibuya defined city's vision as Shigai wo chikara ni kaeru machi Shibuya ku. Straight translation is turning differences into strength. Sometimes we use this vision in English as you make Shibuya. This means diversity and inclusion as the core value of the city. This applies to everything we do, not only in the field of human rights, but also in the business, entertainment, education, and so on, everything. This is why five years ago, Shibuya started recognizing same-sex couple for the first time in Japan history. And now it has spread to 60 cities and more than 1,000 couples have, nationwide have received the certificate. Up to date, Shibuya has recognized 53 couples, but some of them were international couples. We felt it is necessary to support non-Japanese speaking people. So we approached LAN and for support. And today we are pleased to announce that the English translated manuals are finally available on city's website. We deeply appreciate LAN's passion to support the community and their effort to translation for translation work. And the latest Shibuya City News features world famous fashion photographer, Leslie Key and his partner, Joshua, who lives in Shibuya City. We also appreciate land support for them through the process to receive the certificate. This is the nearly first time that legal expert of all areas gather to provide up-to-date overview in English. Again, thank you very much for Lan's courage to make it happen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Nagata-san. I am Natsuki Hosoya from Lan. Uh, today, we have seven leading experts for our five topics. After the second topic, we will take a nine minute break. The first topic is movement toward marriage equality in Japan. The second topic is immigration status and same-sex couples in Japan. After break, the third topic is workplace issues. The fourth topic is issues and situation faced by transgender people. And the last topic is support by municipalities. We have no Q&A session today but 
we will accept your question through online by online viewers and through paper by the floor. The floor participants can ask your questions to our experts here after this event by 8.30 p.m. today. And Lan will answer some of online viewers' questions on the website later. Before starting our seminar, we would like to share the current status in Japan briefly. Around the world, there are currently 29 countries and regions where same-sex marriage is allowed. All G7 countries, except Japan, recognize marriage equality or same-sex partnerships. According to an OECD report published this year with regard to legal LGBTI inclusivity, Japan is ranked 34th in the 35 OECD countries. In this field, unfortunately, Japan has fallen behind other countries in the world. However, there is still hope those days a lot of local governments have introduced recognition of same-sex partnerships or established anti-discrimination rules in order to secure the relationships and rights of same-sex couples. Also, more and more companies have changed their rules for employee benefits to allow LGBTQ employees to participate. Laws and the options opinions of judges are changing also. Some new rules that entered into force this year definitively state the duty of employers to prevent workplace harassment relating to sexual orientation or gender identity, including outing at the workplace. Last year, a local court acknowledged the right of employees to use toilets according to their personal gender identities. Today, we have several wonderful lecture, le lecturers who will review the situation of LGBTQ rights in Japan. Let us proceed with the lecturers. So let's move on to the first topic, movement toward marriage equality in Japan. Our first speaker is Takeharu Kato. He is a member of the legal team of Freedom to Marry for All lawsuit. So here we address marriage equality lawsuit and the campaign in Japan. Our second speaker is Alexander Domitorenko. He is a co-chair of LAN, and he will talk about the viewpoint on marriage equality in Japan issued by American Chamber of Commerce in Japan, ACCJ. So please proceed, Kato-sensei. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, good evening. My name is Takiharu Kato. I would like to introduce by, uh, myself shortly. So, uh, the next please, yeah. Uh, I was born and grew up in Japan and now living in Sapporo, Hokkaido. Uh, I'm a practicing lawyer since 2004 and Director of Marriage for Japan since 2019. I'm a member of legal team of Freedom to Marry for All or Freedom of Marriage for All lawsuit. Uh, I, I studied at the New York University School of Law as a visiting scholar from 2016 to 2017. I was studying about uh, LGBTQ legal issues in the US. Next, please. I, I was one of the key members of the group which worked on the movement to introduce the same sex, uh, introduce the recognition of same sex couples in Sapporo, named Domestic Partnership in Sapporo. A lot of newspapers and the TV stations covered our activities. Next, please. Next, please. Okay, thank you. We met the mayor of Sapporo and requested him to introduce the recognition of same-sex couples in Sapporo. Next, please. 
Finally, Sapporo became the first major city designated by ordinance which recognized same-sex partnership in June 2017. The two men in the photo on the right are not a couple. The younger man is the first person who registers his partnership with his young partner. The other person is our leader, Ken Suzuki, a professor of Meiji University. Next, please. Then I would like to explain the overview of freedom of marriage for all lawsuits, which is the first case in Japan to challenge the unconstitutionality of not legalizing same-sex marriages. We filed lawsuits in five cities nationwide, Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, Sapporo, and Fukuoka. The plaintiffs were 13 same-sex couples altogether. We filed these lawsuits on February 14, 2019 at the same time, except for Fukuoka. The lawsuit in Fukuoka filed on September 5, 2019. Next, please. Our court filing is widely covered in media, not only Japanese media, but also international media such as New York Times, BBC, CNN, and so on. The picture on the left is the plaintiffs and the lawyers of lawsuit in Tokyo District Court. The picture on the right is the plaintiffs and lawyers in Sapporo. In Sapporo, all the plaintiffs are anonymous and do not appear in the media because they are afraid of discrimination and slander. Next, please. In this lawsuit, we are making a claim that the fact that the diet is not amending the law to allow same-sex marriage is a violation of human rights based on the constitution and the country should make compensations you may be wondering why we are asking for compensation in this case. What we are really demanding is a law that recognizes same-sex marriages. It is not money that we are seeking. Why are we asking for money then? The Japanese judiciary system is not able to pass judgments solely regarding interpretations of the constitution itself. It is not permitted to file the abstract lawsuit requesting a judgment on the constitutionality of equal marriage. We need to give specific cases of how same-sex couples' rights have been violated. Therefore, we will first make a claim for compensation, then also add a claim that this is a constitutional violation. Next, please. The key to this lawsuit hinges on how the constitution views marriage between couples of the same sex. According to Article 24, Paragraph 1 of the Japanese constitution, phrase of the mutual consent of both sexes is often construed as between a man and a woman and interpreted to indicate a ban on same sex couples marrying. However, this provision only prescribes the mutual consent of the two individuals who want to get married and not the consent of the head of the household, as was the case in all the pre-war laws. Nowhere in the constitution does it prescribe marriage between two peoples of the same sex. When the constitution was written, no nation in the world allowed for same-sex marriages and people just couldn't even imagine marriage between two people of the same sex. Therefore, it is not possible to interpret Article 24, Paragraph 1 of the Japanese Constitution as prohibiting the marriage between same-sex couples, as there was no way they could ban something they could not even imagine happening at the time. Next, please. On the other hand, Article 13, of the Japanese constitution is famous as being explicit about all of the people shall be respected as individuals and calls on the protection of pursuit of happiness. Thus, whether someone should get married or not, 
and if they do want to get married, with whom and when they get married should be a decision made freely by the individual. If that holds true, then same-sex couples should also be protected under Article 24's freedom to marry. But as same-sex couples are not permitted to marry despite this, it is a violation of the same-sex couples of freedom to marry, and thus that would be in breach of Article 24 of the Japanese Constitution. Furthermore, Article 14 of the Japanese Constitution states, all the people are equal under the law and there shall be no discrimination. Therefore, it is in also in violation of Article 14 of the Japanese Constitution and the discriminatory that different sex couples are allowed to marry and receive the benefit of the institution of marriage, but the same is not permitted with the same sex couples. Prohibiting same sex couples from marrying is thus unconstitutional. Next, please. The abstract of the government's counter argument is that the Constitution Article 24, Paragraph 1 prescribes that marriage shall be based on the mutual consent of both sexes, meaning between a man and a woman, and same sex marriage is not expected in our constitution. Therefore, constitution permits differences between heterosexual couples and homosexual couple, and then there is no issue of whether or not the current situation is unconstitutional regarding Article 24 and 13. The government also emphasized that the purpose of civil marriage system is reproduction. Same-sex couples cannot give birth of their biological children, Therefore, it is reasonable for the civil law to allow only heterosexual marriages. Next, please. One year and nine months has passed since we filed these lawsuits. Court proceedings have been generally delayed due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is the only court that is not affected by COVID-19. Yes, it's Sapporo. In Sapporo, we had a final court hearing on October 28, 2020. The nation's first judgment will be handed down at the Sapporo District Court on March 17, 2021. Please pay close attention to it. Next, please. I'm going to continue the, to talk about campaigning by Marriage for Japan, which is another one of the two wheels of the car along with the lawsuit to achieve same-sex marriages. Next, please. At the beginning, we try to build litigation-centered campaign because most of us are lawyers and we get used to such kind of campaign. However, our ultimate goal is moving the diet to legalize marriage equality. We realize that litigation is not enough to reach this goal, and we need strategy. The lawsuit is one piece of building block, and we need other concrete actions to acquire the support from the majority in the diet. To build the strategy and promote the action based on it, we founded, we founded the organization Marriage for All Japan. Next, please. Most of the directors and members are lawyers. Uh, the number of the lawyers are about 30 people, but we are not good at PR and advocacy and so on. Therefore, we invited public relations professionals, video professionals, and so on. Next, please. These members are divided into two teams, such as public relations, litigation support, event, collaboration with businesses, advocacy, global relationship, researching, and funding. Next, please. We have had many kinds of events which were intended to spark a debate on same-sex marriages, considering that there is still very little social debate on, the, on this topic in Japan. Next, please. 
we invited Evan Wilson from the US. He is the leader of Freedom to Marry, the campaign organization for achieving marriage equality in the US. We have exchanged views with the person who have worked hard to achieve marriage equality in Australia and Ireland, as well as with organization in Taiwan, the first country in Asia to legalize same-sex marriages. We also learn a lot from uh, their experiences. Next, please. We have had seminars collaborating with university and businesses. Especially we have collaborated with the wedding companies. They are very interested in same-sex marriage, and, uh, uh, interested in uh, marriage between same-sex couples. Next, please. We visited New York City last summer and interacted with LGBTQ organization there, the ACLU's, NYC Commission of Human Rights, and so on. We also, uh, the, since our ultimate goal is to legalize same-sex marriage, lobbying lawmaker is the most important activities. Most of the opposition parties have already expressed their support for same-sex marriage, but we continue to lobby the ruling liberal democratic party as well. Some of the members in liberal democratic parties support our activities, so we need more and more uh, diet members in, of LDP. Next, please. We also joined the World Pride New York City with 4 million participants from all over the world. Of course, we join Tokyo Rainbow Pride every year. We also made a various kind of the videos and uh, we uploaded these videos on the YouTube channel called MFAJ channel. Next, please. At the end of my presentation, I would like to ask you your kind support for us. Donation in either way is welcome. The monthly supporter, this is the, the specific system. Uh, people pay, for example, 1,000 yen or 3,000 yen monthly to us, or a one-time donation is just one time, so the, or 10,000 yen or something like that to pay as uh, only one time. So you can choose either way on the website, or we will submit your petition, which urges the court to hand down the decision in favor of us. This uh, petition is happening in the website change.org. So we already submit uh, the petition to the Sapporo District Court, and we will submit to the other court in near future. So oh, please make a petition on that the website and also showing your support in your sns is also very very welcome uh, if you would like to update our court cases and activities please visit our marriage for all japan website unfortunately it is under construction right now but we will let you know as soon as it has been completed thank you very much so if you have any questions, please post on the chat or some kind, something like that. I want to answer it later. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kato Sensei, for your wonderful speech. Our next speaker is, as I introduced, Alexander Domitorenko. He is long co-chair to talk about the support from companies in Japan. Alexander. If you please. Yes, Daisuke. Uh, konnichiwa, Kato Sensei. Konnichiwa. And greetings from Hachijojima. Uh, it's a pleasure being with you in spirit, uh, especially having full spectrum of Japan with us today. Um, I will talk today about uh, the business case for marriage, which supports obviously the legal case for marriage, the one Kato Sensei described. 
we also believe and work closely with MFAJ to ensure that actual support for marriage is not just in the court of law, but, but throughout the Japanese society and critically Japanese businesses. So uh, allow me to move to the next slide, please. Thank you. A viewpoint on marriage equality actually takes uh, its roots in the American concept when the litigation in the US went to the Supreme Court, the companies uh, wanted to support e equal marriage and filed the amicus brief in which they stated that they believe that there's a business case for marriage, that there are people who work for them deserve equality and that the companies want to be competitive and then the country has to be competitive internationally. Because by then, as you may know, many countries, including Canada, my own, and many European countries have already had equal marriage. So we wanted to do something similar in Japan to allow the platform for the corporates to show their support for equality for the in individual employees, but also for the community in general and for Japan. We launched the viewpoint over two years ago at our gala event, which is annual. And uh, initially it was the ACCJ viewpoint, the leading uh, chamber of commerce, who put together along with us and along with five other chambers, this document. And the document basically said that because equal marriage is such a fundamental right, it is important not only for individuals, but it is important for companies alike. And it's very important for Japan. We launched it in 2018. A year later, 56 entities endorsed the viewpoint. And the next slide, please. The four key points and elements of the viewpoint are as follows. It's actually, yes, please stay here. Thank you. The viewpoint argues that the companies want to preserve and ensure that the diverse and inclusive community within their own organizations is fundamental. They want to ensure that their employees who are LGBT feel being part of the workforce and workplace and to allow themselves to fully be productive and be full member of the companies. As you know, for many Japanese companies, the workplace becomes a family. And if your family member is hiding something so important that being gay or lesbian or transgender, that, that company member will not be a full family member. And that's something that the companies fully understand, particularly in their experiences internationally. And speaking of international experiences, the Japanese companies and those are here in Japan realize that we actually compete for talent. And we've seen many Japanese talent that was LGBT, that was bilingual or otherwise, were leaving Japan because they did not feel that they could really fully live their lives here. They couldn't marry, they couldn't have families, couldn't have kids, they couldn't come out at work. So they found a better place geographically elsewhere. Well, we don't wanna lose them. And we actually wanna be able to bring more people to Japan, the LGBT talent to make Japan even better and more competitive. And that's the last point here. Japan actually gradually through the work of LAN and MFAJ and others and Shibuya Ku has become much more ready for marriage equality. Multiple studies show that, that overwhelmingly now the younger population up to 60 years of age supports the marriage equality. The government studies showed that women who are married in, in overwhelming majority, 70% support equal marriage rights for LGBT couples because they know how important it is to have this legal institution of uh, marriage. The next slide, please. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have 56 companies that are uh, being part of our um, a year later. And now, uh, as of this year, as of just a few uh, days ago, we have 109 endorsements. Can I move to the next slide, please? These have been names as of October 23rd, uh, but among those names, can I just mention that we have been successful to really uh, spread the word of love and inclusivity, not only to foreign entities, but actually many Japanese companies. You will see Lixil, 
SoftBank, Panasonic, Marui, and others that are part of this movement to promote marriage equality in Japan. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. What I wanted to uh, show you as well, how the marriage equality again progresses in Japan in terms of the support for marriage equality by the uh, corporates. We saw it began in uh, two, uh, somewhat two and a half years ago uh, with zero, then 17, you know, six, 69 at the end of last year. And this year we have 109. Next slide, please. Critically, when you look at the industry support, it's across all of the spectrum. The corporates obviously lead the way with over 50%, but critically law firms and banks, those are that are very conservative, they support marriage equality. And it's important for us because we at LAN, we represent law firms and lawyers, and this is a very conservative field, but also we understand the importance of law and equality. Next slide, please. By region, Japan actually now leads the way with 43% followed by North America and Europe. And the last slide, please. I wanna say a big thank you, arigato gozaimasu, to uh, the team uh, that's put this together, but also to all of the corporates and allies who really become ambassadors for the LGBT community to ensure that our equality is become, becomes the reality. We are grateful from land and from the LGBT community for your support, for your leadership and for your big heart. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, can we proceed to the next speaker? Uh, our next speaker is Masako Suzuki. She is an expert on immigration cases and handling LGBTQ and residency issues. She will address immigration status and same-sex couples in Japan. So please proceed, Suzuki-sensei. Sorry, so uh, hello, uh, my name is Masako Suzuki. Uh, I'm a practicing lawyer in Japan. I have uh, worked as a lawyer for more than 20 years and uh, I'm I'm handling a lot of immigration cases, and I'm also handling the uh, LGBT cases, mainly from the viewpoint of the immigration. So today I'm talking about the immigration status and uh, LGBT uh, and the same-sex couples. So it's, uh, sorry. So before reviewing the immigration status of same-sex couples, I want to uh, share, okay, thank you. So I would like to see the immigration status of spouses of different sex couples. In Japan, the immigration statuses, uh, there are around 30 statuses and uh, they are divided into two. One is one category uh, is statuses is listed in table one and the other is listed in table two. And uh, ta uh, the statuses in table two, uh, statuses uh, given based on the personal status and uh, uh, statuses in table one is uh, are given based on the work or study. And uh, regarding the spouses of different same sex couples, so the status is given um, by the relationship is uh, in the PowerPoint slides. So spouses of Japanese, uh, their status uh, would be spouse or child of Japanese national and the spouses of permanent resident uh, their status uh, would be spouse or child of permanent resident. And uh, the status given for spouses of long-term residents, uh, there is no status of spouse or child of long-term resident, and they are also given the same status as a spouse, long-term resident. And uh, if the, the spouses of foreigners with status of diplomat, 
or official status. Sorry, the slide doesn't change. While they are trying to adjust the solve the issue, so the, may I, I'm continuing my presentation. So the the spouses of foreigners with thank you with diplomat or official status, the spouses are given the status of diplomat or official, and the spouses of foreigners who has a status based on activities such as work on and study, they are given the status of dependent. Next slide, please. So then uh, let's review the uh, status of spouses of the same sex couples. So the first, uh, the spouses of Japanese. Actually, there is no status given to spouses uh, of the same sex couples and uh, if the partner is a Japanese. And uh, if the, uh, the, uh, the, for the spouses of foreigners with status of diplomat or official, in this case, the spouses are also given the status of diplomat or official. And uh, spouses of foreigners with some status, any, uh, any status based on study or based on work or based on personal status, anyway, spouses of foreigners with some status. Uh, so they are given the status of designated activities. That's the situation. And uh, next slide, please. So uh, this type of this type of uh, this this treatment is based on this notice. The notice is uh, the the title is immigration and residence review for spouses of same sex spouses. So uh, I would like to see what is written in this notice. Next slide, please. And in this notice, uh, the uh, MOJ says that the term spouse in the terms of the status of residence dependent or uh, and spouse of permanent resident or others. Anyway, the spouse refers to a spouse of a marriage treated as a valid marriage in Japan. And it does not include a spouse from a same-sex marriage, even if the marriage was validated in a foreign country. That's the basic stance of the MOJ. Next slide, please. So as a, as a general rule, the, the notice says, spouses of same-sex marriages should be allowed to live in Japan under the status of residence designated activities. So as a result of the, uh, this notice, the, the treatment of same-sex couples are like that. So I would like to see the examples of the same-sex couples. Case one is the uh, a French and French couple and uh, the marriage uh, is registered in France. In this case, the uh, partner uh, is given a status of designated activities. And uh, a couple, uh, a French and German couple, and the marriage are uh, registered in uh, in France and Germany. In this case, again, the partner uh, is given a status of designated activities. But so, if, if a couple is also French and German, but the, if the marriage is registered in France only, in this case, the uh, the partner is not given uh, a status of designated activities. But in this case, I, I assume somehow it's possible to register the marriage in German, on, uh, German too. In that case, after the registration of the marriage in Germany, so then the partner can get the status of designated activities. And case four, uh, if a, a couple is French and Russian, and as, uh, as the, in Russia, the same-sex marriage is not allowed. In, as a result, the marriage can be registered in France. In this case, the, uh, the partner, as the same-sex partner, is not given a status of designated activities. And uh, case five, if uh, a French and Japanese couple, 
uh, as the as you see the in Japan the for now the same sex marriage is not allowed so the registration uh, is possible only in France. In this case, the same-sex partner cannot given a status uh, of designated activities. And uh, if the uh, if the partner, uh, if the couple is, for example, Russian, Russian, in this case, registration is impossible. In that case, the uh, the same-sex partner is not given a status. Next slide, please. So then, um, I, let, I would like to see the reasons for the notice. The notice says, in light of the recent legal developments in other countries, like in France at the time, and uh, in consideration of the humanitarian aspects of same-sex marriages in Japan, as well as in the home country, they, the notice says that these are the reasons for the notice. Next slide, please. However, the result of this notice is really absurd. For example, we see case four. Case four was a, a French and Russian couple. And in this case, the couple cannot live together in Japan, no matter how long they have lived together in France or another country. And, <laughs> And uh, this is also <laughs> really absurd, I think, but the spouse of a Japanese national can obtain status of residence only if the Japanese renounces his or her Japanese nationality. Because if the Japanese renounces the nationality, so then it's a foreign couple. And uh, if the marriage is, uh, can be registered in the country, so then it's possible to, for the couple to live in Japan together only by renouncing the Japanese nationality. Next slide, please. So that's the current situation in Japan. And, uh, uh, but uh, in this situation, there are some developments. And uh, I would like to see the latest situation. So uh, I would like to introduce one case, uh, which, are, uh, the case which, is, which is a case of a Japanese and Taiwanese couple. And actually, I'm a member of the lawyers group for the case of this couple. And uh, they had lived together uh, for more than 20 years. And uh, however, the Taiwanese had no status to stay. And uh, at some point, the Taiwanese uh, got arrested because he had no status to stay. And uh, at that time, I, I didn't join the group, but the, uh, the another members of the lawyers group uh, supported the couple uh, from at the stage of the administration, and uh, they, they try to uh, they try to. Uh, appeal that the, the Taiwanese should be given a status to stay uh, because considering the relationship with the Japanese, but the immigration refused and the deportation order is issued and uh, we filed a lawsuit. And, uh, but finally, in this case, uh, the Taiwanese uh, it was given a long-term residence status after the testimony of the couple. And uh, actually the court suggested the MOJ uh, to to give a status to stay outside the court. So we didn't know that, but later we knew that. And finally, the Taiwanese got the status to stay. Next slide, please. And the, actually, there was another case that, uh, uh, the similar case uh, where the uh, an overstayer uh, was given a status based on the relationship of uh, with the Japanese and the same-sex couple. However, uh, this is uh, another uh, case uh, which is pending at the Tokyo District Court, and I'm also a member of the lawyers group for the for the case too. And uh, this in this case, the couple is a uh, Japanese and American, and they have lived together for more than. 15 years in Japan and US. And uh, they got married in US soon after the marriage uh, became possible in US. And uh, the, they, they, they made a lot of efforts to, to live together, like the American, uh, the American uh, got a 
status to study uh, in Japan and actually they studied, he studied Japanese or he tried to get us, he, he got the status based on his work. Or so, so they made such efforts, but finally, uh, so he had no, there was no status uh, which is eligible for him. So we applied for change of status regarding him based on the relationship with the, with the Japanese. However, MOJ rejected the case. The, he, they didn't give the, any status to stay to him. So now the case is, uh, the, the case is pending at the Tokyo District Court and uh, the case is still going on. So if uh, you are interested in this case, uh, please come to the court. And the actual next court date is uh, January 15 and the time uh, it's 1.45 and the uh, uh, Tokyo District Court. So if you're interested, you can uh, please contact me later and I can give you uh, more details. Next slide, please. And so I, I talked about uh, some development, my good and bad, but uh, at the court and, uh, but also there's some positive, uh, positive development uh, at the parliament in the politics too. So here is the, the remark by Taro Kono, uh, at the Minister of Foreign Affairs at that time. Next slide, please. So actually, it, as you see, it's really absurd that uh, if the, cup, the a partner of the couple is a Japanese, so then the couple cannot live in Japan together. And uh, Taro Kono admitted it. He says that the, the fact that a Japanese partner in, same, in a same-sex marriage is not allowed to enter the country is clearly a strange it is clearly strange. And the Ministry of Foreign Affairs ha has already raised this issue with the Ministry of Justice and within the government, we are actively considering ways to correct this problem, to solve this problem, it's, uh, he said. So we, uh, we expected a lot when we heard this remark, but it was, the, the remark was made two years ago, but uh, since, uh, still now there has been no change. And so I would like to see the general immigration, uh, the idea, the general idea of the immigration status in Japan uh, before uh, finishing my presentation. Actually in Japan, so the, the Supreme Court judgment, which was, uh, which was made more than 40, 40 years ago, still, uh, still, still how can I say, dominating the current uh, idea of the immigration status in Japan, which is the status is free to decide whether or not to accept foreigners in its own country and what conditions are imposed on them. And the fundamental human rights of the constitution and uh, only guaranteed within the framework of the uh, foreign residence system. So this idea is harshly criticized by experts and scholars, but still this is the, uh, this is the principal idea uh, in at the court. Next slide, please. However, uh, for example, in Europe, uh, there are some uh, there are some cases regarding immigration status of same-sex couples. For example, in international, uh, sorry, yeah, European Court of Human Rights or European Court of uh, Justice, and uh, these are the uh, names of the cases. And uh, in these cases. The courts said that the uh, states have to execute their immigration policy not to violate privacy and family life. And it is discrimination based on sexual orientation uh, not to give a status to a same-sex couple partner. And uh, if residence of a same-sex partner of an EU citizen uh, is, uh, sorry, so yeah, if the, if the residence of a same-sex partner of a EU citizen uh, is not accepted, it violates freedom of residence of the EU citizen too. So I think one point is that, that they clearly recognize that their same-sex relationship is family. And uh, 
as a lawyer, uh, I'm struggling to have the same thing recognized in Japan too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzuki Sensei, for your special lecture. She will be here after this event. If you have any questions, please ask her. From now, we are supposed to take a nine minute break. However, we are running behind schedule, so we take a five minute break. So please come back by 7.05. And unfortunately, in Japan, in Japan, there are very limited resources that are available in English. During this break, we will introduce some organizations, communities, and lawyers you can access in English and other English resources that might be useful when you need information. All information includes URLs and QR codes for your convenience. And you can access this information on the website of CBS City after this seminar also. So see you again. Thank you. We are happy to meet you again. Welcome back to this seminar. On our third topic, Yuri Sugano, Director of LAM and a partner at Nishimura and Asahi, specializing in labor law practice, will talk about the past, current, and future situation regarding the circumstances of LGBTQ people in the workplace. Sugano Sensei, please proceed. Also, Sensei, could you hear my voice? Yes, well. And how about the uh, video? Could you see my uh, face? No. Ah, yes. Uh, yes. Oh, really? Okay. So if you can see, because I cannot see, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's okay. So uh, good evening, everyone. As Jose has introduced, my name is Yuri Sugano, uh, director of LLAN and a partner at Nishimura Asahi, specializing in labor law matters. Today, it is my honor to be here to speak to you about the LBGQ rights at the workplace. Before we begin, I'd like to give 
to you an understanding of the flow of today's discussion. We are going to start from the past, walk through the present, and eventually discuss the future. That way, you will have a clear understanding of where, you've, we've, where we've been and where we are going. So please, uh, so during uh, my presentation, I will turn off my video as I would like to maintain the quality of my voice. So let's begin with the first page of my PowerPoint. Socially, LGBTQ minority members have been marginalized as a workplace in Japan. Harassment regarding sexual orientation and gender identity, such as discriminatory speech, unjust dismissal, unfair demotion, have become serious issues, but have often been overlooked at the workplace. Coming out about LGBTQ-related issues was neither welcome for employers nor amongst colleagues because they had no idea about how to treat these issues appropriately. Frankly speaking, coming out is risky on the side of LGBTQ minorities as it may trigger harassment at the workplace. Therefore, the work environment has historically been uncomfortable for LGBTQ employees. On the legal side, the responsibility of employers towards LGBTQ members was ambiguous. In the past, there were no clear guidelines or best practices regarding LGBTQ harassment issues. In addition, the number of cases required, required to establish precedents regarding best practices at the workplace were insufficient. However, there was an important court case ordered by the Tokyo District Court in 2002. In this case, the court nullified the disciplinary dismissal against a transgender employee whose physical sex was male but identified as female at the workplace. In that case, the court decided that the employee's behavior of not following the company's work rules and the employer's administrative order did not justify the disciplinary dismissal. However, the present situation is far more promising as both social attitudes are changing and legal issues are continually being brought to the court. Please go to the second page of my presentation. We can see that one big reason for such change is that the global attitude towards the LGBTQ community has been changing and has become more pervasive in Japan. More and more multinational corporations in Japan, regardless of their size and industries, need to accommodate global standards including how to respect LGBTQ rights at the workplace. In addition, the general attitude towards the LGBTQ community in Japan has been improving significantly. More than 50 local governments, including Shibuya City, who took a lead on this issue, have established some form of partnership in systems. With respect to the changing attitude at the workplace, a survey in 2016 by Rengo, the Japanese Trade Union Confederation, showed that the majority of survey respondents agreed to forbid discriminatory treatment and harassment based on sexual orientation and gender identity at the workplace. Hence, companies have started to become more inclusive even though LGBTQ employees are still insufficiently protected at the workplace. On the legal front, we can see that in January 2017, the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare revised a guideline for employers regarding their duty and appropriate treatment to prevent sexual harassment, which declared sexual harassment included 
harassment between same-sex individuals. Furthermore, in January 2020, the ministry also is issued a guideline for employers regarding their duty and appropriate treatment to prevent power harassment. The guideline mentioned that power harassment includes discriminate, discriminatory speech related to sexual orientation and gender identity, as well as unapproved outings. Regarding the president, the Tokyo District Court confirmed that the limitation of toilet use at the workplace against the transgender employee was illegal and ordered the employer to compensate the said employee for mental damage. Moreover, many Japanese corporations have established their own best practices to protect LGBTQ rights at the workplace. Since 2016, Work with Pride, a voluntary association to support diversity management, has established hours to evaluate companies' efforts to protect LGBTQ rights at the workplace. In 2020, 233 companies applied to the awards. Many of these companies made a variety of efforts to realize diversity and inclusion, such as establishing corporate missions and rules for di diversity and inclusion, maintaining social welfare systems open to same-sex marriages, creating internal communities for LGBTQ employees, as we can see, some significant efforts are being made towards establishing standards. Lastly, I would like to mention where we are going on the third page of my presentation. Acceptance rates towards the LGBTQ community will continue to increase as Japanese media attitudes toward covering LGBTQ issues has improved. More firms will become aware that development of diversity and inclusion will lead to an increase in their enterprise value as SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, has become an important issue for management. On the legal end, we expect that more comprehensive registration will be enacted to protect LGBTQ rights and equal treatment in corporate practices will become the national standard. As a result, we hope the work environment in Japan will eventually become true LGBTQ friendly. Okay, Sensei, I finished my presentation and then could you see my face and also voice? Yes. I believe we are on the screen. Uh, thank you, Sugan Sensei, for your lecture. And I have a question for all listeners. Uh, what should LGBTQ employees do first when they feel they are harassed in the workplace? Thank you. I think the most important thing is do not hesitate to consult with someone else. So if you can trust and you think uh, the company, the, your employer can deal with this case appropriately, and please go to the section of compliance section or HR section. Or if the company has an internal reporting system, uh, you can use the system as well. If uh, you think your company cannot deal with this case appropriately, you can also consult with labor bureau. So uh, I think it's important uh, so that to uh, stand the situation uh, by yourself, but to consult with someone else. And one another thing I think it's important uh, when a uh, uh, the employer, the, the employee, consult with such case. Uh, please uh, may, uh, be clear about the scope of the people uh, that uh, the employee uh, want to disclose your sexual orientation or gender identity because it's important. And then uh, 
this scope uh, of people, the, the range of people, shouldn't be misunderstood by uh, within the parties. Well understood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, much. Sugano-sensei and Hotsuya-sensei Hotsuya for your brilliant lecture and short Q&A session. Q &A session. Thank you. Oh, may I? Video. Video. Okay, next topic is issues and situation faced by transgender people in Japan. Naosuke Fujita, co-chair of LAM, will address the current legal environment for transgender people in Japan at work, together with court decision in Japan. After Fujita Sensei's session, Mai, she has a bilingual communications section at Mori Building Corporation will share her experience about working in Japan. So please proceed, Fujita-sensei. Hello, th uh, my name is Naosuke Fujita, and I am co-chair of LAN together with Alexander that gave a very passionate uh, talk earlier today. Um, before I turn to Mai, uh, who will give you advice based on her real life experience in navigating the Japanese corporate and workplace culture, I wanted to provide you some background on what's been happening in Japan around the rights of transgender people. And I wanted to do this because I wanted to provide you tools to help you have a constructive engagement with people you need to talk to, whether in your workplace or in other areas of your life. Regrettably, uh, notwithstanding uh, Sugano Sensei's um, assessment, which I agree with, Unfortunately, these developments are not yet universal knowledge. So I wanted you to have those knowledge uh, as tools to engage in the conversation. Um, oh, sorry. Where do I? What? Oh, sorry. Um, in the context of the workplace, there is a very basic provision in the labor contract law, which basically covers all employer-employee relationships. Article five of that act specifically talks to an employer's obligation to ensure that employees are able to work in a safe environment. Such safety includes not just physical safety, such as on the, on the factory floor, but also psychological safety, that you feel secure and safe and can be your true self at work is broadly speaking, already an obligation of an employer. Sugano Sensei touched on these decisions, but I wanted to delve a little bit uh, deeper into them. It may surprise you, but as far back as 2002, which is almost 20 years ago, a Japanese court, the Tokyo District Court, recognized the pain and suffering that employees are subjected to when employers are not willing to understand nor engage. In this case, an MTF employee, after working as a male for 10 years, sought to work in her true identity at work and asked her company to accommodate that request. The company refused to engage with her and denied her request. The court's view that eventually denied uh, uh, the, uh, the company's action was as follows. The court recognized that the employee was under significant pain and suffering if forced to conduct herself as a male or restricted from conducting herself in her true gender. The employee's request to work as a female and be provided appropriate accommodation was, in the eyes of the court, with good reason. The court found that there was no effort on the part of the company to either understand nor to make appropriate accommodation. 
the company did explain concerns with respect to reactions from other employees or customers, but the court said that that is something that can be addressed properly over time and is not material enough to warrant the action taken by the company. Almost 20 years later, in January 2019, the two Supreme Court justices, justices in the highest court of Japan, made the following statement. This was in the context of Japan's Gender Recognition Act, and more specifically, the requirement under the act that one must undergo surgery to have his or her gender properly recognized. But um, the two, and that particular requirement was not struck down, but in their supplemental opinion, the two justices you see here expressed the following opinion as part of the official court's opinion. Gender is an attribute of an individual in leading social life and in establishing relationship and is an inseparable element of one's personal dignity. The pain and suffering of transgender people regarding their gender identity is an issue society must address. We wish society understand the issues faced by transgender people and appropriate steps are taken by those concerned from the perspective of individual and personal dignity. And then later that year in December 2019, shortly after the Supreme Court judgment, the Tokyo District Court provided its judgment on an employee seeking the reversal of an employer's order restricting her use of the restroom or otherwise in respecting her gender. The court, perhaps following the Supreme Court judgment, recognized that gender is an individual attribute that is inseparable from a person's individual dignity. The right of a person to socially live in one's own gender identity is an important legal right. Restriction on such essential facilities as a restroom is a restriction of such important legal right. The employer must consider all circumstances, including the employee's individual circumstances, as well as change in social norm and may not category deny such requests. So these are very positive developments that can be used um, and in engaging with your employer or in other areas. The other developments, recent developments that I wanted to mention, uh, the first one was mentioned by Sugano Sensei. In last year, the Japan passed the anti-power harassment law in which employers are obligated to take steps to prevent power harassment. The Japanese parliament specifically in passing the law provided an express mandate to the government to ensure that such power harassment specifically address harassment that is based on sexual orientation or gender identity. The government guidelines that was issued in January 15th therefore mandates a company to create appropriate policies and procedures, establish the right consultation system, and when such events happen, prompt investigation and remedial action is required. And in the course of such investigation, uh, the privacy of the individual must be protected. One more development is most recently in September, the Science Council of Japan, which is an organization of 210 academics appointed by the prime minister, made a recommendation to enact legislation to guarantee the dignity of transgender people. The Science Council, while its members are appointed by the Prime Minister, is an independent body and provides recommendations, including recommendations in the area of social science. So finally, before I turn over to my, I want to let you know that uh, I have listed resources here the links to all the judgment and all the resources. Some of them are in uh, English, some of them are in Japanese, are listed here. These will be made available later on Land's website, but I wanted you to have this. Um, and I finally, uh, I don't have time to touch on this, um, but um, I have, this will also be available on Land's website, but Japan's legal gender recognition law and the requirements that is set out is shown here. Um, there's been legal challenges to these requirements that went right up to the Supreme Court, but they have not yet been 
abolished. Um, I will leave this here. And without further ado, I would now like to turn the virtual podium over to Mai. Mai? Hi, can you guys see me there? Yes, we can. Okay, um, so here I am. Hi, I would like to thank Fujita Sensei for a start and all of the people at LLAN because I'm just in awe of the energy and passion they put into helping people uh, like me, like us, make this world a better place. And so let me talk a little bit about what it's like what, what it was like for me coming out of the office and what it's like working here in Tokyo. Before that though, I think it's important to understand the environment that we're talking about here. We're not talking about the legal environment. The legal environment is what the lawyers are doing and that's what the court cases are trying to resolve. What we're talking about, what I'm gonna talk about is the environment that's comprised of the people that with whom you work. You can't expect if you couldn't expect yourself to understand what you were going through, you certainly can't expect others to automatically understand everything either. So in an environment like a Japanese company, like where I work, say a thousand people in the office, the expectation is that we all work as a group. Japan is a group oriented culture and it works best when we, when we function within the parameters of the group dynamics. So what a, transgender person specifically needs to consider is that their physical appearance is obvious. It's not like things that are inside of you, it's things that are outside of you. And I think that if we can understand that what people are seeing is going to be received in a variety of ways, we're doing the best we can to try and approach it properly. I was very impressed. There was a, a, a large uh, company for whom I spoke uh, earlier in the year, um, in, in Japan and they are really on the ball and their recommendations were to create an environment where the managers were approachable and where the staff were encouraged to approach the managers. Earlier, Sudana Sensei talked about talking to HR or to compliance and I fully concur with that. That's a really good idea. That's how I proceeded. They are the most receptive because that's their job. And if you can take into account the environment within which you're functioning, within which you are appearing different, then you're going to be better off. We can all use the bathrooms and so forth, but it's, that doesn't change how people look at you versus how they looked at you the day before when you came in looking entirely different. So what I did is I, about three years before I was actually able to walk into the office presenting as a female, I spoke to personnel. And personnel's response to this was typical of a Japanese company's personnel department. They took a lot of notes. They listened to everything I said without offering opinion and took copious notes. They said, okay, let us, let us look into this a little bit. And I thought, okay, well, that's a good idea because you're starting from a position of not having full information. And so you want to get to a position of having enough information to make a reasonable decision. And I'm learning as I go, to be honest. So they took that information away that, from our interview together. And they said, they, they looked at what was happening in the industry. They looked at what was happening with other Japanese firms, what was happening in the world. They did a lot of research. And about every two or three months, they came back to me with further questions. And their questions related to what we've been hearing tonight, you know, how far do you want to go with this? And, and what is it going to involve? And how does it impact your life and talk to us about all of that. And, and I was very open with them because another aspect I've found of Japanese companies is that you tend to feel like you're part of a family. Um, group dynamics tend to breed that uh, as opposed to a, a dagger in the back sort of meritocracy like you might find in other countries. Here it's a very group oriented concept of the company. And I feel that way strongly about Mori Building. They're a very family oriented company. So that went on, that two or three month gap, and then them talking to me happened and it went on for a little while. We then started making plans to get this out to the employees. Well, personnel then needed to talk to senior management. Senior management was also 
very interested in learning before making any decisions. They wanted to know what was going on. Uh, no one employee should dictate policy for everybody. And that was an approach with which I was comfortable and, and familiar. Um, in particular, senior management tends to be a little older, which means that they're likely to be a little bit more conservative. But the other side of the coin is that older people tend to be very much live and let live in their perspective on life. And so I dealt most frequently with one of our, our senior uh, people, one of our vice presidents, and he was very curious. He learned, he talked to me and we, the personnel department and I got it to the point where I was interviewed by the in-house magazine and that was published at the end of the year uh, in 2015 in our last uh, newsletter. And then I was introduced at the first chode, the first um, group gathering, the first uh, in morning meeting of all of the staff. I was, the, the vice president got up in front of everybody and he said to people, he said, look, this is now my, you know, you are no longer going to know her as who she presented as before. This is my, and uh, part of our company and uh, performing a job. And it's important for all of us to embrace her. And because of the very uh, steep slant of the, of the organization chart in Japan, people below the vice president were all very eager to do exactly what was asked of them. I didn't sense that people were doing it out of duty. I sensed that people were doing it out of actual kindness of heart. And I broke the, gro the age groups down into, I can break them down into their reactions. The people in their fifties and above were very much live and let live. Okay, fine. Are you still doing your job and you're in a position of some management? We need you to continue to do that. The people in their 20s, maybe into their 30s, didn't even realize that something was different because they'd grown up as part of a generation that accepts these things, accepts the fact that there are different sexualities, that there are different gender identities, and they were as good as gold. It was the people in their 40s that were a little bit, well, am I management or am I able to handle this? And it took them perhaps a week. But throughout that week and, and since then people, especially the women in the company were first to come up to me and welcome to the team sort of thing and very warm and genuine. Um, the men in the company were largely, except for that 40 year old group were largely initially right at day one, very eager to embrace their family member, me in, in who I was. And, and then we went back to work and within a week, everybody was on board. I took it upon myself to use the ladies' restroom on our floor um, after a period of time, because that is the one refuge that women have got from the rest of the world. And it's a place which I'm not gonna disclose all of the, the mysteries about to all of the men watching, and we'll keep it amongst ourselves for the ladies, but trust me when I say it's a place that is special. And so what I did was I waited about six months to use ladies room on our floor and use the ladies room on other floors so that I could allow them to feel the change as opposed to simply understand the legality of the change. And then as I moved, and then, and then the, the personal department again announced that from such and such day, I would be using the ladies room. They were absolutely incredible. Uh, they, they welcomed me. I was, I was nervous as anything. And I was at the mirror and I was fixing my face and somebody so a younger person. And that I think says a lot because younger people typically don't address older people with a, a pat on the back. But this younger person just gently tapped me on the shoulder and said, it's so good to see you in here, Mai. And I felt welcomed because that, that was the last place to be welcomed. So my, my message to those that are considering coming out, that are transgender, considering coming out at the office, bear in mind that this is Japan, that this is a group oriented culture. And if you can address your role in that group, as a member of the group, taking into account all members of the group and everybody's sensibilities, then I think you're gonna be doing exactly what the company would expect of you. And that will be the best way to go forward. A lot of good advice tonight. I'd like to wrap up quickly by saying thank you for this opportunity to speak. And anybody out there listening is more than welcome to reach out to me through LLAN uh, or whatever means you have at your disposal. I would love to hear from you. I'd love to talk to all of you. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everybody.
Thank you, my son and Fujita sensei. Our final speaker is Kei Furuchi. He is one of the members of, your, of, of Civil City Partnership Certificate Manual Translation Project. He will address LGBTQ support provided by municipalities like Sibuya City. Uh, Fruit Sensei, are you ready? Yes, please go ahead. So thank you very much, um, Natsuki, for your kind introduction. And is my voice OK? Um, yes, it's good. So. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Kei Furuchi from a law firm, Mori Hamada and Matsumoto, also a member of LAN. In my part, as the last session of this online seminar, I will outline the LGBT support by local municipalities in Japan with a special focus on the so-called partnership system. Some of you may have heard of this term partnership system, but may not be necessarily familiar with the details of the system. So in this session, as a brief introduction to the partnership system, I will explain what the partnership system is, some stats on the system, and how to get the partnership certificate, especially in Shibuya city, and some points to keep in mind when foreigners use this system. So now let's move on to the first point. Briefly explain what the partnership system is. Actually, um, different local governments have different definitions, but in Shibuya city, it is a system to certify the relationship between two persons as a partnership with a degree of substance not dissimilar to that of a legal marriage. Under this system, when the same gender couples are officially recognized as partnership, they will obtain from Shibuya city a partnership certificate. And also as explained by Mr. Kato Kato Sensei at the first session, legal marriage between same gender couples is not currently recognized in Japan. And so this partnership system is separate and different from legal marriage at the national level. However, at the local government level, a movement has started to promote the creation of a society that respects the human rights of LGBTQs. And this system, partnership system, was first introduced in Shibuya and Seragai cities in 2015 with a strong passion for achieving equality in society. The slide shows some examples of the benefits of having partnership certificate, such as ability to avail joint mortgage loan, ability to designate your partner as life insurance beneficiary or eligibility for family discounts on several services. And also in some cases, obtaining a partnership certificate may make it easier for the partner to be granted hospital visits as a family member when the other partner is hospitalized. However, it should be noted that the details of the partnership system vary from city to city and it's essentially up to the individual company or organization to decide whether and how to offer these benefits. Thus, the benefits listed here may not be always available. But having said that, the passion for achieving equality through the partnership system, as well as the range of benefits offered by the companies are expanding. And we expect to see both more users of this system and the more companies offering benefits in the near future. So the next slide shows some stats on the partnership system, which was already briefly explained in the opening talk by Nagata-san. As of um, um, September 30th, there are 1,742 local municipalities in Japan now of which 60 local municipalities have introduced the partnership system. This covers almost 30% of the population in Japan. And actually, since October 1st to date, some other local municipalities have already introduced the system and some others have already decided to introduce it in the near future. 
So the, num the actual number is higher than 60. And even if it's not a legal marriage, there are many couples that decided to be officially recognized as partners by local municipalities. Indeed, as of October 1st, 1,301 couples received partnership certificates or received later a partnership vow, which is provided in other, other local governments. And this system is not only for Japanese nationals, but is often available to foreign people living in Japan. And this is also addressed by another sign in the first session. On September 23rd, photographer Leslie Key and his partner, um, Joshua Vincent Ong received a partnership certificate from Shibuya City as the 15th couple registered officially at Shibuya City. And on their Instagram, you can see beautiful photos of the two dressing in Tom Brown, holding a partnership certificate in their hands. So let's see how to get the partnership certificate in Shibuya City. There are four requirements and four steps to obtain the partnership certificate. Both parties of the same gender should reside in Shibuya City and be registered as residents. They should have attained 20 years of age and should not have a spouse or other partner and should not be a close relative of each other. Of these four requirements, the first one is particularly important to keep in mind. This requirement means that uh, two persons do not need to live in the same address, but they must both live in Shibuya and be registered uh, resistant, residents. So if one person moves out of the Shibuya city, the super certificate must be returned. And if these four requirements are all met, the two persons, couples, can use the partnership system in Shibuya City. To get the partnership certificate, the first step is to download the guides and templates available on the website of Shibuya City. These guides explain the requirements and the whole process of a partnership system in detail. English versions are also available on the website. And I put this code on the slide and by scanning the code here, either smart or something, you can go to the web page listing the old guys. After you understand the whole process by reading these guys and templates, confirm date and time of visit with public notary office and prepare notary instruments there. This requirement of preparing notary instruments is a kind of unique feature of a partnership system in Shibuya. While the certificate, as I explained in the uh, previous slide, the certificate itself uh, has um, basically no legal effect. These notary instruments create a legally secure relationship between the two parties. And as a general rule, you need to prepare two different notary instruments, which are uh, notarized agreement regarding cohabitation and other terms and notarized voluntary guardian, guardianship contract, which is uh, basically to designate the one person, one part, partner as voluntary guardian on behalf of the other person to act as a proxy when the other person is unable to exercise proper judgments and decision due to um, some serious illness or impairment in the future. However, if special requirements are met, only a notarized agreement regarding cohabitation and other terms will be sufficient. And in fact, many cases use this special rule. I won't get into too much detail here about the required contents of the notary instruments or the special rules, but please see the English guides available on the website. Once the notary instruments are ready, it's time to file an application at city office. Make sure you don't forget the necessary documents, which are all listed in the guise, especially if you're a foreigner, fill out and submit a written statement, affidavit, indicating that you have no spouse or existing partnership at the time of application. And after about one week from the application, you can get the partnership certificate and it's all done. And that was the whole process of obtaining partnership certificate at Sh in Shibuya city. 
However, um, there are two concerns for foreigners who want to use this partnership system. For foreigners who do not speak Japanese language, language issue can be a barrier. As explained in the previous slide, Shibuya City provides English versions of all guides on its website with very detailed explanations. And I hope you can understand the whole process. However, no face-to-face -face or online consultation in, the, in English are provided by the municipal offices, not only in Shibuya, but other uh, municipalities. And it is especially important to understand what the legal effect the notary instruments will have on both parties um, under the uh, partnership system in Shibuya City, but this may be difficult, especially for foreigners. In particular, when a non-Japanese speaker prepares notary instruments at the notary public office, there must be a person who can interpret the communication between notary public and the non-Japanese speaker under the Notary Act. So you need to find an interpreter or a lawyer who understands foreign language to act as an interpreter. But having said that, there is growing recognition of the need for foreigners to use the partnership system. And it is strongly hoped that the current concerns will be resolved in the near future as deep understanding and strong support spreads. So let me wrap it up. The partnership system is different from legal marriage and the benefits are limited at present. However, an increasing number of local municipalities and companies organizations are recognizing that the system can help to achieve equality in society for LGBTQs. At present, it may be difficult for foreigners who do not speak Japanese to use the system in some aspects, but the movements such as providing English language guides have just begun to encourage foreigners to use the system as well. And we will continue to expand our support so that every couple can use the partnership system without barrier and create the true equality in the future in society. And that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fruich Sensei. And thank you very much all of the speakers and viewers and listeners today. We are very, very happy to share this event with you. And now it's time to say goodbye. So let me hand over to Fujita Sensei and Kimpara-san from LAN for the closing remarks. Fujita Sensei, please. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you for joining today's event. We hope that this event was a step forward in filling the void that we wanted to fill, namely the lack of information available to those whose native language is not Japanese. In closing this event, there are lots of thank yous here, but I'd like to thank our sponsors, Shibuya City and Robert Moses for their support and encouragement. Our speakers, who generously share their knowledge, wisdom, and time out of their very hectic uh, schedule. Our dedicated and passionate volunteers. And last but not least, to all of you who gracefully spent time with us tonight. This event could not have happened without your participation. Let me now turn to Akihiko, the person behind the scenes who helped pull all of this together, Akihiko. Thank you very much, Fujita Sensei. Um, thank you very much again for all of you for your participation of this event. Um, my name is Kimpara Akihiko, and I support LAN as administrative manager of, uh, as a volunteer. I hope that the information uh, presented today are uh, proved to be useful for you and can help some of you to address the issues you may be facing. Although registration regarding LGBTQ policies in Japan are still developing, the LGBTQ communities and its allies are working hard to promote the LGBTQ rights. An increasing number of companies and local municipalities are showing their support 
to this movement. Governmental policy is also gradually changing for the better. I, we believe this trend will continue and the pro-LGBTQ policies will become more entrenched going forward. Lawyers for LGBT and Allies Network will continue to organize similar events to promote LGBTQ rights in Japan. Please find our website for more information and materials of today's event will be uploaded of our website. You can also see our email address in case that you would like to contact us. Thank you very much again for your participation and we hope uh, to see you again in our future events. Thank you very much. Arigatou gozaimashita.